Another story tells how two American tourists named Brent and Clarice survived an almost death roll from an aggressive Nile crocodile. American tourists and wildlife enthusiasts Brent and Clarice were on a trip to the Nile River to explore and catch footage of different wildlife. They loved going to various rivers as they always wanted to get a glimpse of nature. Most significantly, they have a shared interest in crocodiles. Moreover, they've also been vlogging about crocodiles on every trip. They are dedicated to capturing the most detailed and up-close shots of crocodiles. This time, they wanted to capture footage of the infamous Nile crocodile, considered the most dangerous crocodile species on the planet. Brent and Clarice prepared a picnic on the banks of the Nile River before trying to plunge into its waters for a swim and get a glimpse of the Nile crocodile if they're lucky enough. They enjoyed eating their packed lunches as they thought of ways that could attract the crocodile and get close to them. Crocodiles are very attracted to noise. What if we make a loud sound that they could hear even in the distance, Clarice suggested. Brent was somewhat skeptical about Clarice's plan, knowing they were dealing with the most dangerous crocodile species ever. He still wanted to ensure that what they were doing was safe and would not harm the two of them. They're the most dangerous crocodiles, remember? Brent answered. Clarice heaved a deep sigh and stared at the waters beside them. It seemed like she agreed with Brent. Before she could even say anything more, Brent noticed something bizarre at the same riverbank they were in, just a few meters away. It was the Nile crocodile, resting and frozen at its place. Brent slowly poked Clarice's shoulder and told her to keep quiet before pointing to the resting crocodile in the distance. When Clarice turned to look at it, she tried her best not to scream as the crocodile was only a few meters away from where they were now picnicking. Clarice grabbed her camera from her bag and quietly took footage of the crocodile. They thought they were lucky as the crocodile was not moving and only resting to cool its body down. With this, Clarice decided to stand up and move closer to the crocodile to get the closest footage she could get. Brent also stood up and followed her. The crocodile unexpectedly jumped to bite Clarice with its jaws, which caused Clarice to step back in horror and drop her camera in front of the furious crocodile. It was as unexpected as it could be. The two were terrified and backed away as the crocodile approached them slowly. Clarice stared at her camera just right in front of the crocodile. She was hesitant to escape because she had all her footage on that camera. Brent was begging her that they should leave, but she just stood there. While staring at the camera, the crocodile launched another attack at Clarice. Luckily, Brent managed to grab her by the shoulders and pull her away from the crocodile's jaws. There, he held Clarice's hand as he forced her to flee together and run as fast as they could not caring about the camera anymore. After running for a few minutes, the two looked back and saw they had lost the crocodile. Clarice regrets losing the camera, but at least she didn't lose her life from their encounter. Our next story is focused on Jeremy March, a young fitness enthusiast and hobbyist runner from Australia. The incident occurred in August 1994, when Jeremy was preparing for a long-distance marathon by running along the Boyne River. The morning started like any other, with Jeremy taking his car out to the river where he would do his warm-up and continue running along the Boyne for a certain distance before running back. Three miles into the run, Jeremy felt the August heat make him a bit dizzy, but it was nothing he hadn't experienced before, so he pressed on. Six miles in, Jeremy noticed his dizziness had not subsided and decided to find some shade to rest under and refuel. The bank of the Boyne presented him with a few trees and bushes, so he took the opportunity and sat down. Although he drank his water and had a bite to eat, the heat was still overbearing, which caused him to doze off. According to Jeremy's statement, he did not remember how long he was asleep, but it couldn't have been more than 10 minutes. Eventually, when Jeremy woke up, he felt refreshed and ready to continue his run. But he felt something was wrong. His backpack containing his phone and supplies was gone. Still sitting down, he looked around to assess the situation and his blood froze in his veins. Lying in the sun, barely five yards away from Jeremy, was a giant crocodile. Unmoving, but menacing. 
However, he did not notice Jeremy and turned away from him toward the river. His backpack was near the beast's tail, and Jeremy needed his backpack to avoid passing out in the heat again. He slowly got up from his shady spot, tiptoed behind the croc, and grabbed his backpack to make a run for it. It's important to remember that crocodiles can spin 180 degrees in a split second, even though they appear to be slow-moving animals. The same thing happened with Jeremy's croc, which turned around immediately and grabbed one of the straps on Jeremy's backpack. After clamping its jaws on the strap, it rolled and ripped it off, forcing Jeremy to fall on his back. The croc scrambled forward towards him, and Jeremy could only see the croc's massive maw as it rushed in. Instinctively, Jeremy kicked back and moved away from the croc, ripped backpack clenched in his hand. He said he could not remember how long he sprinted before he collapsed, but luck was on his side as another runner preparing for the same marathon came across him and took him to safety. It took a few days for Jeremy to recover and get back on his feet, and there was no long-lasting damage from the attack as the croc only managed to murder his backpack. While shaken by the incident, Jeremy eventually got back to training for his marathon, running into his good Samaritan and running with him until the end. Jeremy went on to participate in more marathons in the future, but he limited his training grounds to more urban areas. Ryder, a young teenager, and his father Tim went kayak fishing at the Boyne River in Gladstone, Australia. Ryder wants to learn to be a professional angler like his dad, Tim, so he requested to take him to Boyne River to learn how to fish like a pro. As they were now in their kayak, Tim sat near the bow, the front of the kayak, and Ryder sat near the stern, in the rear. They peacefully paddled across the river until Tim found a perfect spot to teach Ryder how to fish. While Tim was teaching Ryder how to use a fishing rod, Ryder was caught off guard by a strange sight near the riverbank. Instead, he ignored what his dad was teaching him and stared closely at what caught his eye. Turns out it was a crocodile just resting at the riverbank. When Tim noticed Ryder wasn't paying attention, he scolded him. Ryder told his dad about the crocodile and pointed it out. After that, they decided to move to another spot where no crocodiles were around. As Tim paddles the kayak forward, Ryder tries to have one last glimpse at the riverbank where he first sighted the crocodile and notices that it's not there anymore. Ryder grew concerned and warned Tim about the crocodile suddenly disappearing from the riverbank. Tim assures Ryder as they arrive at another spot, and when they got there, the most unexpected thing just unfolded right where their kayak was. Before Tim could prepare his fishing rod to teach Ryder again, a crocodile suddenly jumps from the water and onto their kayak, with half of its body sitting on the small boat. Both of them jumped in their places in surprise as the crocodile attempted to get near Tim and bite him. Ryder was terrified as he screamed in panic, knowing that there was a crocodile on their kayak and there was a chance they might sink in the river if the crocodile didn't fall off their boat immediately. The crocodile moved forward and got close enough to bite Tim's left arm. Tim screamed in pain as the crocodile was now trying to drag him underwater. Ryder suddenly grabbed his wooden paddle and repeatedly bashed it on the crocodile's head. Seeing that it was working, he kept hitting the wooden paddle against the crocodile's head until he got the perfect chance to gouge its eyes out. Ryder bravely approached the crocodile and wrestled it by gouging its eyes out. When the crocodile is hurt, it opens its mouth, allowing Tim to free his hand. Afterward, Ryder grabs his paddle again and gives the crocodile one last blow before it gets off the kayak and swims away. After the terrifying encounter, the two paddled back to where they came from and immediately went to the nearest medical facility to help Tim with his bite wound and Ryder to rest after beating up the crocodile. Adesh is a local Indian worker, but his daily job is something most people won't even dare to do, feed a crocodile. He is working as a crocodile handler at the Madras Crocodile Bank Trust and Center for Herpetology, a reptile zoo located in Chennai, India. He has been a regular worker for almost a year and is working daily to feed Shonu, the mid-sized crocodile he's been handling. Adesh feeds Shonu with its favorite meal of raw chicken and beef. 
As a dash feeds Shenu, tens of people visit the zoo and watch him feed the crocodile. They were amazed by his bravery and composure while facing and feeding such a large creature. One day, Adesh entered Shonu's enclosure with a bucket full of raw chicken and beef. Many people were already waiting outside the chamber for him to feed Shonu. As Adesh is about to take out the first raw chicken, Shonu unexpectedly attacks Adesh by biting his leg, causing him to fall to the ground and get dragged by the crocodile in the water. The people were shocked as Adesh tried to kick the crocodile with his free leg, but it was useless. The crocodile kept dragging Adesh into the water and started biting through his leg once again. Adesh desperately screamed for help as the crocodile showed no signs of letting him go. A concerned local named Jai climbed up the protective fence of the enclosure and went inside the chamber to help Adesh. He tried to get a chunk of raw chicken from the bucket and threw it beside Shonu, hoping it would catch its attention and let Adesh go. Unfortunately, Shonu didn't show any interest in the raw chicken and kept biting on Adesh's leg, with Adesh already crying out in pain from the bite. Suddenly, another concerned local named Kabir entered the enclosure and told Jai they should fight off Shonu to let Adesh go. The two of them went to the water and went to fight the crocodile by punching it and forcing it to pry its jaws open. Soon, many locals decided to enter the enclosure to help Jai and Kabir, and after the forced opening of Shonu's jaws, Adesh was freed and carried by another local as they observed he had a severe wound on his leg, which needed a lot of stitches and time to heal. After the attack, Shonu was neutralized and put into a more secure enclosure to avoid future incidents. This unsettling encounter also takes place within the Amazon River. If the first one involves the largest predator in the Amazon, this one is bizarre, as this creature can never grow bigger than two feet, the piranha. Piranhas have been widely known worldwide as highly aggressive man-eaters, as they can attack larger prey. However, their reputation is greatly exaggerated. They only bite people in the dry season or if they smell blood. But despite that, they are harmless creatures as long as people don't make splashing noises in their habitat. Newlyweds Matthew and Mia chose to visit the Amazon rainforest for their first honeymoon trip as a couple. The couple decided to take an extreme trip as they both wanted to do something adventurous for their first trip together. They took a guided tour into the Amazon rainforest with their tour guide, Juan, to help them navigate the thick Amazonian jungle. As they reached the Amazon River, Matthew asked Juan if the latter could leave the two of them for a minute, as they were about to take a short dip into the river. Don't make splashing noises and make sure you have no open wounds, Juan warned them as Matthew nodded to agree. When Juan was out of sight, Matthew took off his shoes and Mia noticed he had a huge wound on his ankle. Mia tried to search their bags for first aid, but found nothing. Disappointed, Mia asked Matthew to try and wash his ankles with the water from the river. Matthew reasoned that Juan warned him not to dip in the water if he had a wound. Mia refused to agree with him. Are there any sharks in here? Only sharks behave like that, she replied as she tried to push Matthew into washing his ankle in the riverbank. Matthew agreed as he sat on the riverbank to splash a little water onto his ankle and decided to dip his feet into the slightly warm water to soothe his wound. As Mia was looking around, Matthew felt something at his feet. At first, he didn't mind it, but when he lifted his feet, he saw a piranha biting onto his ankle and squirming its body. He told himself it was only a small fish, but he was now shrieking in pain. Mia, help me get this thing off, Matthew frightenedly exclaimed as he continued to shake his leg to try and get the piranha off his ankle. Mia courageously grabs sturdy driftwood and uses it to swat the piranha off Matthew's ankle. After a firm hit, the piranha got off his ankle as Matthew stood up immediately and got away from the riverbank. He sat down and saw a deep bite mark around his wound. The couple tried to catch their breath as they couldn't believe they had a terrifying close encounter with a piranha. Nakhan is a regular worker at a renowned crocodile zoo and farm in Samut Prakan, a province in Thailand. He has worked for five years as a crocodile handler of a five-foot freshwater crocodile named Ruok. 
The Crocodile Zoo and Farm have over 100,000 crocodiles of all shapes and sizes in captivity, both freshwater and saltwater. Not just that, the place also has room for more animals other than crocodiles, such as lions, elephants, gibbons, and snakes. There's no wonder why this place has been famous among many tourists and even the local people. Among the 100,000 crocodiles, Ruach was one of the notable ones that visitors often recognize. This is because he has a bond with Nakon, and they always do live shows together, where Nakon feeds Ruach or even teases the audience by placing his head in between the crocodile's big jaws. Nakan was confident that Ruach wouldn't hurt him since freshwater crocodiles were the more docile relatives of the saltwater crocodiles, which were the dangerous and hostile ones. When Nakan isn't with Ruach in its enclosure, he makes the most of his time in the zoo by working in other sections and feeding other crocodiles. Nakan seems to be an expert in what he does and loves his job, especially taking care of Ruach. He loves doing live shows with the crocodile, and he isn't even showing a single tired face to anyone. Even if it seems he's getting too tired or too occupied with working alongside crocodiles for years, Nakan sometimes took extra time to feed and care for his beloved crocodile Ruach. Although Ruach seems shy and doesn't want to mingle with him, Nakan insists on hanging out with the crocodile and doing tricks even if the zoo's closed already. The management has also noticed Nakan and Ruach's unbreakable bond, so they use the two to promote and advertise the crocodile zoo even more. Of course, it worked, and more visitors came to pay a visit to the place daily. Ruach was everyone's star, and Nakan couldn't be even happier with how the people loved to see him and Ruach doing live shows together. One day, the management told Nakan that he should do another live feeding show, since there had been many visitors to the zoo lately. Nakan immediately agreed and prepared chopped meat chunks of chicken and beef to be fed to Ruach for the live feeding show. As the show started, everyone cheered when they saw Nakan enter Ruach's enclosure. Nakan bowed to the audience as he fed Ruach the chicken chunks before giving him the beef. Ruach loved his meal as Nakan gently caressed its head, impressing the audience in front of them. After Ruach had been fed, Nakan began to entertain the crowd by approaching the crocodile and posing for pictures with it, which the visitors loved to see. Nakan then slowly opens Ruach's mouth and places his head between its jaws, which impresses the audience even more. Ruach was opening his jaws, as Nakan confidently gave the crowd two thumbs up to impress them. After the trick, Nakan pulled away from Ruach's jaws and started doing more gimmicks, such as putting his legs between his jaws. The people from the audience were just so impressed with Nakan's bravery and Ruach's docility towards its handler. Nakan did a series of tricks for a couple of minutes, and the last one was sitting on top of Ruach's back. He hasn't done this before but he's confident that Ruach won't react violently to him since he's docile and friendly. Nakan caresses Ruach's back first before slowly sitting on its back. Unfortunately, Nakan accidentally slipped on the small water puddle on the enclosure floor, causing him to plop down on Ruach's back instead of slowly sitting down. Ruach flinched as he felt Nakan's body on its back and swiftly moved away. The audience gasped as Nakan hurt his back, but that didn't stop there. To everyone's surprise, Ruach suddenly charges at Nakan and bites his leg, causing Nakan to scream and the audience to be concerned and terrified. Nakan tries to move his bitten leg to deter Ruach, but the crocodile tightens its jaws around the handler's leg even more. Nakan screams in pain as it concerns the audience and some decide to flee from the place. Ruach suddenly released Nakan's leg, but charged at him again and bit his arm, causing Nakan to scream again for help. The other handlers and staff at the zoo rushed to the enclosure to help him, but Ruach was stubborn and kept biting Nakan's arm. Nakan tried to move his other free hand to try and punch Ruach's face, but it was useless. The other handlers made efforts to hit and hurt Ruach, but it wouldn't let go of Nakan's arm. Just then, another handler bravely goes closer and tries to pry Ruach's jaws open. When the other handlers saw what he did, they immediately rushed to help him, 
and within a second, they successfully opened Ruach's jaws and pulled the helpless Nakan out of its mouth. Then they neutralized Ruach while taking Nakan out of the enclosure to rush him to the hospital. At the hospital, Nakan had suffered severe bite wounds on his leg and arm, which caused him to receive more than 200 stitches to treat it. The management of the crocodile zoo and farm was forced to close temporarily to discuss better what to do with Ruach after the attack. But since Ruach was a longtime zoo resident, they decided to transfer it to a more secure enclosure with two new handlers, while Nakan still recovered at the hospital. Cape Tribulation, within the Daintree National Park in Australia, is one of the most popular ecotourism destinations among locals and tourists. The only downside of this beautiful and majestic place is that it's one of the most crocodile-infested places in Australia, with over 70 saltwater crocodiles making it their home. French tourist Raphael and his wife Agnes were on a boat cruising through the Daintree River on their way to the Cape Tribulation Beach. Even though swimming is highly discouraged at the beach due to the threat of saltwater crocodiles, the couple wants to push through as they dare to take pictures of some crocodiles they'll find. While cruising the Daintree River, there were already a lot of crocodiles that were sighted by the couple. Realizing they'd already seen dozens of crocodiles there, they realized it was indeed a crocodile-infested place. Upon reaching the beach, the tour guide warned the couple not to get too close to the water and stay only in the dry parts, to which the couple agreed. After that, the tour guide decided to check on the place and warned the couple again not to get too close to the water. The couple agreed as the tour guide went to check the area. As they were being mischievous, Agnes playfully went into the water and decided to wait so she could attract a crocodile. Raphael immediately thinks it's dumb, as the tour guide warned them many times, but Agnes didn't listen to it. She kept waiting in the water and teasing Raphael that he was too weak to do what she was doing now. Raphael kept shouting at Agnes to get out of the water, when suddenly Agnes fell and screamed, and bloodstains were visible in the water. Upon realizing this, a saltwater crocodile appears, and Raphael concludes that Agnes was bitten on the leg by the animal. Agnes screams for help as Raphael rushes to her aid in the water, not minding the crocodile a few feet away from him. As he tries to carry Agnes out of the water, the crocodile bites his leg, causing him to fall to his knees and drop his wife. The crocodile attempted to grab Raphael and drag him underwater, but he managed to push the crocodile away with all his strength before carrying Agnes out of the water again. They managed to get to dry land as the crocodile tried chasing them, but got away instead due to how far they were in the water. When the tour guide returned, he was shocked to see bite wounds on Raphael and Agnes's legs. He took the couple back to Daintree National Park to give them medical attention after the incident. From the scorching heat of Rwanda, we now go to Indonesia's humid and complex waterways specifically to the Manus province, a small island on the Bismarck Sea. Manus has always had, and most likely always will have, a substantial crocodile population. While this is a good fact for the crocodiles that live there, the same cannot be said for the natives, who regularly live in fear of being attacked by one of the scaly monsters. The subject of this story is Setia Uwir, a young housewife and mother who was minding her own business on June 7, 2004, tending to her obligations as she usually would. Her day was uneventful as she decided to go to the nearby river to wash clothes. It was a 10-minute walk to the nearest riverbank, and there would usually be more people there to wash their clothes. But today, there was no one. Basket in hand, she walked to the water and crouched down to get the washing over with. About halfway through the washing, Setia looked around to see if anyone else had come to the riverbank, but it was barren. However, she noticed some shuffling in the bushes on the other side of the river, but thought nothing of it. Smaller animals would always roam around these parts, so seeing a few otters in the bushes was a regular occurrence. Setia was almost done with her laundry when she heard the sound of fast-moving water right in front of her. It was followed by a loud splash and the sight of an enormous crocodile's body bursting out of the water. Shot, Setia jumped back and stumbled as she attempted to regain her footing and run to safety. 
She did manage to turn away and run, but this crocodile was quick and sprinted toward her. Thinking quickly, Sentia spotted a nearby tree and rushed to safely climb it. She sat on a branch approximately eight feet off the ground, so the crocodile could not get to her, and it never did. While crocodiles can use their powerful tails as springs to propel themselves vertically, they require water, and Sentia's tree was clear of the river. Because of this, the croc could only lie below the branch, waiting for Sentia to fall off. She was petrified and frantically looked around to see if anyone was coming to the riverbank. Sentia cried for help and she noticed a married couple heading to the same bank to wash their clothing. The man saw the crocodile and immediately ran forward, picking up a large stone. The crocodile opened its jaw and tensed up, intending to run toward the man, but he tossed the stone directly on its nose, forcing it to close its maw and run back to the safety of the river. Setia was shaking and traumatized, but she could walk back to her house. She left her clothes there and returned later in her husband's company. Thankfully, her assailant was nowhere in sight and her clothes were all in the basket. Setia was overjoyed and grateful for the man's quick thinking and invited the couple to their house where she treated them to dinner. Crocodiles are one of nature's most ruthless predators, with some specimens growing to a monstrous 23 feet and weighing up to 2,200 pounds. Crocodiles are the apex predator in any habitat they find themselves in. Much to the dismay of any people that find this out the hard way, crocodiles are one of the only animal species that actively hunt humans preferring to stick to the surface of the water and lash out when the perfect opportunity presents itself. These beasts are notorious for stalking bays and many other waterways in search of prey. The story we have for you today is about Ivana Bako, a resident of Tulagu in the central province of the Solomon Islands. Ivana was a young teacher that worked in her local school teaching children the primary curriculum and anything else she could think of. She loved her job and would often take the kids to the local church on Sundays for prayer and playtime afterward. The walk from the school to the church took less than five minutes, and six children accompanied Ivana. After the service, the children wanted to play hide-and-seek in the woods behind the church. She happily agreed, as she loved seeing the kids happy, but told them not to wander too far away. There were small animals in the woods, so there was nothing to worry about, but the woods also connected to the shoreline where small boats would sometimes find port, and she didn't want to risk one of the kids drowning or worse. The class had a tradition of designating Ivana as the first seeker of the group, so she went to a nearby tree, covered her eyes, and started counting to 20. She took her time to finish the count because she knew the kids would sometimes get flustered and wouldn't know where to hide. When she finished the count, she smiled at the sight of some of the children hiding in plain sight and made a big show of wondering where they were before dramatically finding them. It was all fun and games, and she found all the kids within five minutes. They were cheering at their teacher's seeking abilities, but Ivana was not happy with them. Upon further inspection, she realized that the little girl in the red shirt, Janelle, was not among the children she had found. She asked the children where she was, but no one remembered seeing her. Ivana told the children to go back to the church and wait for her before running into the woods and screaming the girl's name, but no response was given. She ran through the woods wondering how a little girl her age could have gotten so far away. Ivana's thoughts raced as she imagined Janelle in so many different situations, but it wasn't until she heard some giggling nearby that her thoughts calmed down. The giggling came from the shore to the left of the path Ivana had been on, and she was relieved to find Janelle throwing rocks into the water out of harm's way. She approached the girl, stopping about five yards away, and asked what had gotten into her to drive her so far away from the group. She said she liked the water, but her mother told her not to swim in murky water, so she decided to throw rocks instead. Havana asked why she didn't play with the other kids, and Janelle said she was bored with hide-and-seek. Havana found this funny, 
as kids will often ignore the danger to satisfy their curiosity. So she told her to pick up her hat and to come with her back to the other kids. Janelle said she would go and went to toss the last stone she had in her hand. It was a large stone, but not too large for her. As she raised her hand to throw it up, Ivana noticed something disturbing the murky water in front of the child. A pair of eyes and a snout popped up from the depths and Ivana was horrified to see that a massive saltwater crocodile was moving toward the little girl. Instinct kicked in, so Ivana rushed forward and pulled Janelle by the shirt, tossing her to the side and telling her to run away. Just as she did that, her foot slipped in the muck and she stumbled back toward the beast. Her hopes were dashed as she heard a splash behind her, followed by the most excruciating pain as she felt her shin snap under the unrelenting pressure of the crocodile's jaws. Something to understand about saltwater crocodiles and crocodiles in general is that they have the most potent bite force out of any animal in the animal kingdom, beating great white sharks twofold. This aspect of them has remained unchanged for millions of years simply because you cannot improve upon perfection. A bite force like that is enough to snap cow bones in half, and all of that pressure was directed on Ivana's wobbly leg, and it was not letting go. She screamed and fell forward, face first into the sand. The croc pulled her back toward the water, shooting even more burning pain up her thigh. She realized that Janelle never ran away as she told her to, as she saw her curled up next to a log, crying her eyes out as seeing her teacher being attacked by a monster. She was petrified and there was no one to call for help. Ivana wanted to scream at her to get help, to help her, or to do anything, but the pain was overwhelming and she could not get her thoughts together. She could only think about the pain in her leg and her intense desire to escape the scaly horror. Ivana, still screaming from the pain in her leg, lost all hope as she realized that the croc would either pull her into the water or start rolling, tearing her leg off completely. Tears streamed down her face, and she felt the croc's grip on her leg tighten and begin to move slowly. She did the only thing she could do, which was scream. Her scream went from a yell to a sharp shriek as the croc started to roll. It rolled in the shallows, slinging mud everywhere as it parted Ivana's leg from the rest of her, pulling itself back slightly as it lifted its head to swallow. The pain of her bone shattering was gone, but the wound that the croc left was searing and bleeding profusely. Ivana heard a thud and a man's voice grunting to the side of her as the croc finished eating. Her eyes were full of sand, so she couldn't see, but she could feel the presence of the crocodile slink back into the water as the man grabbed her by the arms and pulled her to safety. Ivana didn't know it, but the man was not alone. She felt a pair of hands squeeze her bloody stump, which made her yelp, but the pain subsided due to the adrenaline. A babble of voices got louder as she heard the locals shouting amongst themselves, some to call the ambulance and some to make sure the crocodile was gone. A woman brought a pail of water and washed out Ivana's eyes, letting her see the mass of people surrounding her. The same woman told Ivana that one of the kids told the pastor she had been gone for a long time, and the screaming made him call for help. Two men picked her up and rushed her back to the path she came from so an ambulance could take her in. She was rushed to intensive care and remained there for a few weeks while her condition stabilized. Her family and students visited her in the hospital, wishing her a speedy recovery. Ivana most valued the visit when Janelle walked into the hospital room with her parents, who took her in a loving embrace and thanked her profusely for saving their daughter. Then she knew it was all worth it. The authorities were notified immediately, but the crocodile never returned to that shore and was never seen again. The people of the village drilled the danger of the coast into the kids, and no one played there ever again, often citing Ivana's incident as the reason. Ivana promised that she would never again put any of her kids into harm's way, so she elected to take them to the town square after church on Sundays. After all, 
the town was much more accessible to her wheelchair. The Marina Vallarta Golf Club in Mexico is famous for golf players who love nature. Its astonishing tropical landscapes are home to an abundant number of wildlife, which makes it a perfect place to play golf and spot different animals at the same time. It was a lovely sunny afternoon when a couple named Santiago and Abriela went to visit the Marina Vallarta Golf Club to play their favorite hobby, which was, of course, golf. The couple was ecstatic to play golf together for the first time in many years. Then the two of them started to play just like the old times when they were still young. After an hour of playing, Santiago strikes the ball with his golf club and it unfortunately lands in a water hazard. Abiela notices that they've already run out of balls, so Santiago volunteers to get the ball that has landed in the water hazard instead. With his golf club in hand, Santiago rushes to the water hazard where the ball landed, and a bizarre sight catches his eye once he nears it. It was a crocodile, peacefully resting at the water hazard beside where the ball landed. When Santiago saw the crocodile, he was terrified and decided to tell Abriella. His wife assured him that the crocodile wouldn't do anything as long as he won't threaten the animal. With this, Santiago was relieved and decided to reach for the ball in the water hazard. Holding a wooden stick in his hand and his golf club on the ground, Santiago reaches for the ball beside the resting crocodile. His arm and hand were shaking, along with his legs, as he leaned his body close to the water hazard to try and reach for the ball. When Santiago is about to reach the ball with the stick, the crocodile swiftly snaps at the stick, causing him to flinch and drop it afterward. Santiago fell to the ground and became terrified when the crocodile started to approach him. As the crocodile approached, Santiago froze in his place as he was frightened and didn't know what to do. Santiago did not hear Abriella as she yelled from a distance for him to flee from the crocodile. He only regained his composure when the crocodile attempted to bite his leg, but luckily it didn't wholly bite him. Santiago grabbed his golf club and threatened the crocodile to hit it. As the crocodile approached him, he bashed a golf club tip at the crocodile's head to try to scare it away. It came at Santiago faster and bit his leg, causing him to scream. As the crocodile was now dragging Santiago into the water, Santiago kept bashing its head with the golf club to try and escape, but it was useless. Before they could reach the water, Santiago finally poked the crocodile's eyes with the other end of the golf club, which fortunately worked. Despite having a wound on his leg, Santiago sprints to his wife, Abriella, who did nothing but stare at him in the distance, since she can't help her husband. After the encounter, Santiago was brought to recover in the hospital. At the same time, the management of the golf club decided to close the golf course temporarily to eliminate the crocodile that attacked Santiago. Today's video's last known encounter involves the world's third largest cat, the jaguar. Despite being smaller than tigers and lions, this cat has the strongest bite out of all felines. As its name also means, he kills with one leap. A zoology professor named Aidan Carter has an unsettling and breathtaking experience with the large cat. Aiden went out to the Amazon jungle, searching for unique birds for his next scientific study. The Scarlet Macaw, Toucan, Harpy Eagle, and Amazon Kingfisher are some of the fascinating species he saw while going through the jungle. After hours and hours of searching and taking pictures of all the unique birds he could spot, Aiden grew tired and decided to rest in a space within the jungle. He immediately found a place where he could set up his sleeping bags and nap without harm. This feels amazing having a nap within this place, Aiden thought to himself as he laid down his sleeping bag and took a nap. He immediately fell asleep through the sound of the blooming nature around him. Aiden slept for almost two hours until he finally woke up and felt something strange before opening his eyes. Aiden woke up to find a jaguar hovering over him in his sleeping bag. He could feel his heartbeat going fast, knowing that one wrong move could cause him to fall into a dangerous scenario. Aiden tried not to move an inch as the jaguar scans his whole body and hovers over him. Aiden tried not to show any signs of vulnerability to let the big cat know he won't do anything. 
The jaguar began sniffing him to see if he was a threat, and Aiden took a deep breath to try and reassure himself that he wasn't in danger. The jaguar seemed to be very observant, as it seemed like its first time seeing someone in a sleeping bag in the middle of the jungle. Aiden kept as quiet and still as he possibly could until the jaguar was done scanning him and immediately ran off to hunt for its prey. This is because jaguar attacks are rare, and most of them would prefer to go away in the presence of a human unless it provokes or disturbs them. Still, Aiden Carter is one brave human being who must stay calm despite the potential danger. There was a crocodile in the Palu River in Indonesia with a motorcycle tire stuck around its neck. This might be some ordinary news, but conservationists and wildlife activists were very much concerned about the condition of the poor crocodile, since the reptile might grow bigger and get strangled by the tire. The crocodile, which was a critically endangered Siamese crocodile, was seen with a tire around its neck since the year 2016. It even survived the tsunami and earthquake that devastated the city of Palu in 2018. But the tire is still there, wrapped around its neck. Since there was a growing concern among conservationists and wildlife activists about the crocodile, the officials of Palu decided to reward somebody who could remove the tire from the crocodile's neck. After the announcement, several people and even hunters tried to remove the tire wrapped around the crocodile. But even with their efforts, they can't touch or get close to the reptile. The officials even tried to remove the motorcycle tire by setting up a crocodile trap with meat to lure it, but they failed. A celebrity conservationist in Indonesia even attempted to get the crocodile into his trap, but he was unable to entice it. An Australian wildlife organization even came to help remove the tire, but they also still failed to do so. After the failed attempts, authorities and conservationists slowly lost hope in removing the tire from the crocodile and saving its life from getting strangled by it. However, a group of young wildlife vloggers from America, Percy, Wesley, Bruce, and Alfred, exclusively came to Palu to try and remove the motorcycle tire around the Siamese crocodile's neck. As they arrived at the Palu River, they asked for the assistance of a local tour guide named Adi who was also helping other people trying to remove the tire around the crocodile's neck. Adi assures the group that Siamese crocodiles generally cannot cause harm to humans. However, they still have to be careful not to hurt or threaten it, since they still have a powerful bite like their other cousins in the crocodile family. Percy, the group leader, says they have one unique tactic that won't need to use any other trapping equipment, but only their strength. Since two of the members of their group, Bruce and Alfred, were actually college wrestlers, they considered the task easy to accomplish. Adi reminds them that he's there to guide them and not to stop them from doing anything they want with the crocodile, as long as it will not harm the reptile or themselves. The group agreed and went to the riverside to wait for the crocodile to appear and eventually get out of the water. The group waited for more than an hour until Adi saw the crocodile first that appeared from the water with the infamous motorcycle tire wrapped around its neck. It slowly walked out of the water and onto the shore to doze off, giving Percy and his group a perfect opportunity to remove the tire from the reptile. Bruce and Alfred first approach the resting crocodile as Alfred sets himself in a trap to get the crocodile moving. Percy and Wesley are the ones who will be going to attempt to remove the tire from around the crocodile's neck as Bruce tries to wrestle the crocodile's jaws shut with the help of Alfred. Adi watches the group as he chuckles, seeing this as a silly idea to rescue the crocodile from getting strangled by the tire. The group eventually carries out their plan, with Alfred using himself as a decoy to annoy the crocodile. The crocodile eventually became annoyed by Alfred and started to get on its feet to chase him, as Percy signaled Bruce to wrestle the crocodile by jumping on its snout to close it. Bruce jumped and attempted to slam his body to close the crocodile's snout shut, but unfortunately he was thrown off to the ground when the crocodile resisted. Bruce was then bitten by the crocodile on his leg, causing him to scream in terror. 
Alfred, Percy, and Wesley were shocked as Bruce was dragged by the crocodile to the water and put into a death roll. Adi immediately goes waist deep into the river to save Bruce, as the others did. They tried to fight the crocodile by punching its face, but it wouldn't let go of Bruce's leg. Bruce was unconscious as Alfred attempted to wrestle the crocodile and gouge its eyes out. The crocodile flinched and got hurt, causing it to let go of Bruce. Wesley immediately carried Bruce out of the water while Adi, Percy, and Alfred tried their best to scare the crocodile away. The crocodile immediately swam away from them, leaving them slightly wounded and bruised by fighting the reptile. Adi immediately took the group to a hospital where they were treated for their wounds and injuries, especially Bruce. He was still unconscious, but his condition was more stable than before. When officials heard of the attack, they withdrew the reward and told the people that attempts to remove the tire from the crocodile's neck should be canceled and done by more professional people. The first story will take the audience into the Amazon rainforest, the world's largest tropical rainforest. Visiting this place is a coveted dream among all nature lovers, as it's home to many natural wonders and breathtaking landmarks such as the Amazon River, the longest in the world, and several national parks that tourists can choose from. A trip to the Amazon would be a truly remarkable and thrilling experience to have just for once in the lives of nature enthusiasts, as having close encounters with animal species is a common thing to happen here. This place is home to at least 30% of the world's plant and animal species, and some are only found here, while others are endangered or rarely seen. However, some animal encounters are far from common. Some may become bizarre or chilling. Meet Lucas, Stacy, William, and their local tour guide, George, on a trip to the Amazon. George prepared two canoes, with him and Stacy on one and Lucas and William on the other. The three young adults were excited to embark on a once-in-a-lifetime trip. William, the timid one among the group, decided to take the stern seat to avoid any unnecessary alligator attacks, while Lucas sits on the bow. On the other canoe, Stacy sits on the bow as George sits on the stern. The tour guide states that it's best to put a more experienced person on the stern to escort the tourist in front of him. While paddling through the Amazon River, they were amazed as they witnessed different wildlife along the riverbanks. The students took their cameras from their bags and started taking pictures of the animals, when George pointed out something ahead and told them to keep quiet. Lucas complained as William leaned over and tapped his shoulder. George knows the Amazon better than we do, William whispered, which made Lucas fall silent. George instructed them to paddle slower. George spots an eight-foot black caiman sitting on the banks of the river. Black caimans are the largest of the alligator family and the largest predator in the Amazon basin. They can grow into incredibly large sizes, up to 17 feet, and are aggressive. They do not eat humans, but often attack people when defending their nests or provoked. It's a black caiman. We should stop paddling and see if we disturbed it. George calmly said. As the students stopped paddling, the caiman moved forward slowly until its two front legs were in the water already, which startled the students, especially Lucas, who was sitting on the bow of their boat. On the other hand, William grasped his paddle tightly and tries not to utter a single word, as caimans have excellent hearing. George declared that they all should paddle back, Lucas became frantic as he looked back and forth at George and the caiman ahead of him, causing him to paddle as fast as he could. The caiman submerged its body into the water, propelling it toward the canoes. Lucas and William also panicked in front of George and Stacy's canoe. The situation made them panic again, and they started to move faster than they should. As the caiman approaches, George also paddles back as fast as he can, so Lucas and William can do the same and escape the water in no time. When they reached a safe riverbank, they abandoned their belongings and distanced themselves from the water. The caiman tried to reach out of the water and grab one of them, William standing close to the riverbank. George instructed them to run away, and they stopped running when they couldn't see the riverbank, knowing they were safe. 
George heaved a sigh of relief, knowing the students had survived their experience with the Cayman. The story is set in the arid climate of South Africa, where American tourist Nancy Smith found herself face to face with a giant Nile crocodile during her two-week visit to the Kruger National Park. Nancy saw an ad for a package trip to Kruger where she and seven other people could spend two weeks in the massive park and enjoy themselves. Nancy accepted the offer as someone who loved traveling, and the details were finalized within two days. After her plane landed in South Africa, Nancy immediately acquainted herself with her travel companions, who are around her age and just as eager to take in the sights. When they finally arrived at Kruger National Park, the group was told to wait for the tour guide, who would be guiding them, and a few more groups of tourists visiting the park. They obliged and spent a few hours riding in trucks, looking at the vast array of wildlife the park had to offer. At some point during the trip, Nancy and a few other friends wanted to stretch their legs and look around the park. So they decided to take a brisk walk to a nearby riverbank, where they might see some animals they hadn't seen that day. As they made their way to the riverbank, Nancy couldn't shake the feeling of unease. She decided to lag behind the group a bit, hoping to take in some more scenery before arriving at their destination. She couldn't help but feel that she was being watched as she walked. She turned around and saw nothing, but the feeling persisted. By this point, Nancy was alone and walked toward the group. She heard a loud splashing noise behind her, coming from the river they were walking along. She turned to see a massive crocodile launching out of the water and onto the path. It was headed straight for her. Nancy's heart pounded as she ran back to the group as fast as she could. She could hear the crocodile gaining on her, its jaws snapping as it closed in. Her screams echoed through the small wood they were in, and within a few moments she saw the rest of her group running toward her voice. They yelled when they saw the massive crocodile chasing Nancy and urged her to speed up and get to them. When she was near the group, she turned again to see that the crocodile had backed off and slunk back into the river it came from. She then remembered that the tour guide told them that crocodilians are fast, but they can only run short distances before they must stop. This fact about the physiology of crocodiles is what saved Nancy and perhaps the rest of her group from being eaten by the monster. Shaken, they went back to the tour guide while avoiding the river in the broadest berth they could manage. One of them told the tour guide about the incident, and the man's face turned ghost white, but soon flared with anger as he scolded them for being so irresponsible. Nancy was traumatized by the event, but returned to Kruger the following year, this time decidedly sticking with the group and the guide. The story features an African fisherman named Amari, who almost became a crocodile's meal at Lake Victoria. Amari is a regular fisherman who goes to Lake Victoria daily to fish for perch and tilapia. He's been doing this for years now. He's also aware of the dangers of the lake, including the infamous killer crocodile lurking around. He had previously encountered crocodiles, but he's fortunate for he had never been attacked or approached by one. Thus, he's always confident that everything will be fine every time he goes fishing. One day, Amari went out on his boat to fish for perch and tilapia at the lake. Amari fishes after paddling the boat to a location where he lowers his net. Every single day, he makes a good catch. He fishes, then sits on his boat and takes a break, gazing at the lake's still waters. He also saw other fishermen sailing in their boats to catch fish on their own. Amari watches them as he begins to eat his packed lunch on the boat to rest after catching fish. Amari noticed something moving under the water. He initially shrugged it off as he thought this was another fish. Amari assumed that it would not attack him if it were a crocodile. He keeps eating until he senses something bump his boat from below, which causes him to drop his food. Amari stood up in frustration as he looked at the surprisingly calm waters. He stood there for a couple of minutes, trying to figure out what bumped into his boat, but he couldn't find any. He looked at the other fisherman in the distance and was doing just fine, making him think more. 
A few minutes later, he felt another bump underneath, causing him to fall on his back on the boat. And if it weren't bad enough, a crocodile jumped out of the water, bit him, and sent him into a death roll. Amari screamed in shock as the crocodile emerged multiple times from the water to try and bite his leg. Amari was squirming at the boat and trying to stand up when the crocodile finally bit his leg and dragged him into the water. Before the crocodile dragged him, Amari grabbed onto his paddle and brought it with him as the crocodile's teeth were now penetrating his leg. Under the water, Amari struggled to kick his legs to escape the crocodile's jaws, but it was of no use. He used the paddle in his hand to hit the crocodile in the face multiple times. When he realized that the crocodile wouldn't let go of his leg, he used the paddle's handle to poke its eye. And there, the crocodile immediately released his leg, allowing him to swim back to his boat and escape the lake. As soon as he returned to his boat, he immediately paddled back to the shore. After escaping the lake, he realized the crocodile's bite severely wounded his leg. Still, he's thankful he made it out from the crocodile. Siblings and twins Mitchell and Rebecca have been traveling together since they turned 18. It was their wish for themselves on their 18th birthday to be allowed to travel to different places in the world, and because they are good and obedient children, their parents allowed them to do so. In a year, the two have traveled to different places already. Rebecca loves nature, so they're more on nature trips than going into cities. Mitchell seems to go with the flow and happily accompanies his sister wherever she goes. This time, the two were in Zambia for a week-long vacation. They are already on their fourth day and have explored almost all its capital city and national parks. For their next adventure, Rebecca wants to go and explore the famous Victoria Falls, as well as try canoeing through the Zambezi River, which is one of the most famous tourist spots in the country. When they reached the Zambezi River, they rented a three-person canoe with their tour guide, Komani. The three wore life jackets as Komani sat near the canoe's stern, with Mitchell in front and Rebecca between. Then the three headed out to canoe through the waters of the Zambezi River. While Mitchell and Komani did the canoeing, Rebecca took out her camera to take photos of the stunning Zambia wildlife. They encountered different animals both in the water and on the riverside such as hyenas, baboons, various species of birds, and even elephants taking a plunge. Rebecca was satisfied with all the animals she saw just by canoeing through the river. Rebecca stops taking photos for a while and decides to paddle along with Mitchell and Komani. Komani starts talking about the wildlife of Zambezi River and its reputation regarding its crocodile population. Kamani states that despite the vast number of tourists in the area, there's no denying the constant crocodile threats. Rebecca starts to get terrified, but Kamani cheers her up and says that crocodiles rarely harm tourists and that the number of crocodile attacks is very few. This calmed Rebecca down as they stopped canoeing for a while to rest and take time to mesmerize at the beauty of the environment. Everything was quiet until Mitchell mischievously stood up in the canoe to take pictures. The canoe was about to be overturned when Komani managed to get a hold of it and calmly told Mitchell to sit down. Mitchell apologizes and said that he wants to see the environment better. Rebecca also advises him to sit down in the canoe, but he doesn't listen. Instead, he teases his sister by dipping his foot in the water over the side of the canoe to prove that there are no crocodiles around them which makes Komani furious. Komani furiously tells Mitchell that the canoe will overturn if he doesn't sit down. Mitchell apologizes again and reasons that he wants to wash his feet. Komani obviously didn't want to argue with him, so he sat quietly and watched Mitchell tease his sister Rebecca more by dipping his feet deeper into the water. Rebecca pleads with her brother to stop and sit down, but Mitchell won't stop dipping his foot while purposely laughing to annoy her. Rebecca rolls her eyes at him and, just like Kamani, stays quiet while Mitchell does his thing by dipping his foot. Mitchell kept dipping his foot until a crocodile suddenly jumps out of the water to nibble on his legs before grabbing him from the canoe. The canoe was shaken as Rebecca screamed in horror while Komani tried to calm her down. 
Before Mitchell could even open his mouth and scream, the crocodile had taken him underwater and yanked him into a death roll to drown him, terrifying both Rebecca and Komani. Komani tried to use his canoe paddle to hit the crocodile with it, but the crocodile kept attacking Mitchell and showing no signs of stopping. Other canoes with tourists and tour guides arrived and saw the horrible scene. The tour guides from the other canoes decided to jump into the water to help rescue Mitchell from the crocodile. Kamani also jumped in to save him, as they punched and kicked the crocodile underwater to stop it from killing Mitchell. Rebecca could only cry seeing the blood on the water, knowing that her brother might not survive the attack. One of the tour guides decided to punch the crocodile while Kamani tried to gouge out its eyes. Luckily, the crocodile was hurt, which made it release Mitchell, as the other guys grabbed him and carried him to his canoe with Rebecca and Komani. Mitchell fell unconscious as Komani got out of the water and paddled to the nearest riverbank to try and get medical help for Mitchell. As they reached the nearest hospital, Mitchell suffered a severe injury on his leg, which caused him to lose the ability to walk until he fully recovered. The possibility of surgery to repair his leg was also high since the injury had damaged him so badly. Despite the risk of being attacked, the other tour guides and Komani came to help him, and he made it through the encounter alive. The last story features a handler at an Australian zoo named Timmy James and his incredible experience with their trained crocodile, Zach. Timmy is working as a handler for the zoo's trained crocodile, Zack. Zack has been in the zoo since it was a hatchling, which means that it's been trained to follow commands from its keepers, especially Timmy, its handler. Timmy and Zack were always the stars of every feeding show held at the zoo. Timmy would enter Zack's enclosure to feed him meat by hand and not get attacked, which the visitors at the zoo find amusing. Timmy has loved interacting with Zack ever since. Today is another crocodile feeding show, and every visitor has been excited to see how Timmy feeds the colossal Zack. As soon as the show starts, Timmy enters Zack's enclosure, a concrete platform on top of an artificial pool made just for the crocodile. Zack was lying there on the platform as he waited for Timmy, approaching him with a bucket full of meat. Timmy waved and smiled at the crowd before getting a piece of meat from the bucket. The visitors closely watched him. He showed it first to the public before commanding Zack to open his mouth. Zack opened his mouth wide slowly, amusing the group, and waited for the meat to be placed into his mouth by Timmy's hand. Timmy slowly stretched his arms and attempted to feed Zack by hand, when Zack unexpectedly closed his mouth when Timmy's arms were halfway inside. The crowd was shocked as Timmy panicked and tried to pry Zack's jaws. Still, Zack only dragged him under the water which made other zoo handlers concerned about the situation. Desperate to escape, Timmy was forced to fight out of Zack's jaws. He kicked and punched Zack multiple times until he decided to gouge Zack's eye with his hand and swam back up. As soon as he was back on the platform, he immediately escaped the enclosure as the other zoo handlers assisted in treating Zack's bite on his arm. Pastor Nahomi is a leader at a local church in southern Ethiopia. He's been devoted to spreading the gospel to as many people as possible for the past five years, during which he has preached the Holy Scriptures to his congregation. When Pastor Nahomi is out of his job as a pastor at the church, he takes his time working as a fisherman in Lake Chamo. He always takes his son Amadi everywhere when fishing. Pastor Nahomi and Amadi do not only do fishing for their own food, but they also provide food for some church members who aren't fortunate enough to work to buy their own food or get food from fishing. With this, Pastor Nahomi has been loved by many church members for being thoughtful and caring toward them. New members of the pastor's local church must undergo a baptism ceremony to be an official part of the congregation. One of these was Tafari, who was Pastor Nahomi's younger daughter. There were a total of 20 new members that Pastor Nahomi had to baptize, including Tafari, and he's doing the ceremony the next day at Lake Chamo with Amadi as his assistant. The next day, the 20 new members, Pastor Nahomi and Amadi, gathered at the lakeside for the baptism ceremony. 
He preached an uplifting and inspiring message before inviting everyone to pray and proceed with the tradition of going waist deep into the water. He starts off by baptizing Tafari and one member after another. The ceremony was going well when Amadi told his father that he felt something strange with the water. Pastor Nahomi assured him that maybe he was imagining things and needed to focus on assisting him with the ceremony. Amadi tried to focus on assisting his father, but suddenly a giant crocodile jumped out of the lake and grabbed Pastor Nahomi by the torso, fully engulfing his right arm. Amadi and the other members were surprised as they ran to the lakefront immediately, leaving the pastor on a death roll with the crocodile. Pastor Nahomi remained conscious as he could feel the crocodile's jaws slowly crushing his body. The other male members of the church tried to rush to the scene to rescue him, only to get deterred by the crocodile threatening to attack them too. The pastor tried to reach for the crocodile's eyes with his other hand, but he struggled. Afterward, the crocodile goes underwater as Pastor Nahomi panics and becomes more desperate to escape the animal's powerful jaws. He moves his body but struggles as his right arm is inside the crocodile's mouth. Meanwhile, the fishermen from the lake were told by the church members that a crocodile had just grabbed Pastor Nahomi, so they tried to throw in their nets and trap the crocodile, but they failed. The pastor struggles underwater as he begins to feel himself at his edge. When Pastor Nahomi realizes he can move his right hand inside the crocodile's mouth, he tries to move it around and find something he can grab onto and hurt the animal. Suddenly, his hand reaches the crocodile's palatal valve, a tissue behind the tongue that covers the throat underwater. He immediately grabs it and pulls it with all his strength, causing the crocodile to panic and open its mouth, releasing the pastor into the water. Pastor Nahomi swiftly swam to the surface, and he was grabbed by church members waiting for him to appear in the water. They didn't expect him to still be alive since the crocodile was a giant, but they were thankful that he made it out alive, despite being heavily bloodied. The pastor was immediately taken to a hospital after the attack, where he suffered injuries and wounds on his body. His church members, who were grateful for him, decided to take care of him and look after him until he was fully recovered, including his children, Amadi and Tafari. Fishing is one of the small pleasures of life, and people love to go to exotic locations to get away from the urban world and have fun. One of the most popular locations for fishermen to visit is Rwanda, a country in sub-Saharan Africa where the fishing industry is excellent and the lakes are abundant. Samuel Adams was an intermediate fisherman who took annual fishing trips with his friends to various locations. He had traveled all around the world from the massive lakes of Canada to the lush waterways of Indonesia, and Rwanda was the next destination. On July 17, 2002, a few days after Samuel's plane had landed, the group took a few boats to Kivu Lake, where they would organize their fishing for the day. Samuel took one of the smaller boats a bit further out than the rest of the group, where he spent the next few hours. Fishing was already a relaxing hobby for Samuel, and this day was one of the best of his life. However, his enjoyment was cut short by a strange feeling in the water, rocking his boat slightly. He looked around his boat, but could not find the source of the disturbance. In the distance, he could hear his friends shouting and waving their arms, but he was confused and did not understand why. The last thing Samuel remembered from the entire incident was the sight of massive jaws erupting from the water and grabbing his forearm. According to a statement by one of Samuel's friends, all they could see was the bloodied water and a torrent as the massive crocodile went into a death roll. For context, a crocodile's primary way to dismember its prey is to grab hold of a limb and roll its body to rip it clean off, referred to as a death roll. Two group members frantically rowed toward Samuel's capsized boat with Samuel nowhere in sight, while the rest of the group went back to the shores of the lake to call for help. When they go to the boat, they see a trail of blood under the water, and the croc decides to leave. Looking around the boat, one of his friends spotted Samuel lying face down, unmoving. They quickly pulled him into the boat and applied a tourniquet around his upper arm using a ripped up shirt. He was in critical condition, 
His breathing was shallow and unresponsive. Luckily for Samuel, he managed to hold on until he was transported to the hospital, where the doctor stabilized him and he spent the next two weeks in recovery. The incident was traumatic, but Samuel noted that he cherished his friends for stepping in to save him, and he would forever be thankful for their presence that day. It took Samuel a year to fully recover mentally and physically, but he returned to Rwanda's waterways and lakes a year later, albeit with a lighter forearm. He never used a boat for fishing again, at least not where there was a crocodile population, because he understood the power of nature after his attack, and the fact that humans are insignificant in the eyes of apex predators lingered in his mind. Kian is a 13-year-old boy living in a house near the Baralis Kamua Lake in Sri Lanka while caring for his 4-year-old sister, Nasia. Their parents worked in the city, so Kian was always left to take care of his little sister. For this reason, Kian stays homeschooled since there is no one to take care of his sister for him. He does chores, cooks food, and looks out for his little sister until their parents come home for the weekend. Kian takes extraordinary measures to take care of Nasia especially since their house is beside Morales Gamua Lake. When Kian doesn't have any schoolwork, he takes Nasia out for a walk at the lakeside. Nasia loves to walk around, so Kian always does his best to make his sister happy by taking her to the lakeside. They sometimes visit their aunt Shahani, whose house is closer to the lake. Shahani sometimes goes to Kian's house to look after him and Nasia. She doesn't have any children, so that's why she could easily keep her eyes on the siblings while their parents aren't home. She sometimes brings food for Kian and Nasia, which makes her parents delighted to know that someone older is also taking care of their children. One day, while Kian and Nasia were sitting on their couch watching television, a news report suddenly flashed onto the screen. It says several crocodiles had mysteriously begun appearing from lakes in Sri Lanka and had already infiltrated many people's homes. Knowing that they lived beside Baralis Gamua Lake, Kian suddenly stood up from the couch and looked through the window to check their front porch. He heaved a sigh of relief when he didn't see a crocodile outside and continued to watch television with his sister. The next day, Kian told Nasia not to wander outside the house without him since the threat of crocodiles appearing in lakes had been increasing and they were at risk. Nasia obediently followed her brother and stayed inside the house until Kian finished his schoolwork. When Kian finished his schoolwork, he told Nasia that he would take her outside, but they would only stay on their front porch to eat cookies. Nasia agreed as the two of them went out and sat on the house's front porch while eating cookies and drinking milk. As soon as they ran out of cookies, Nasia told her brother she wanted more. Kian then stands up from the porch's floor and tells Nasia not to move around while he gets cookies inside the house. The little girl nods as Kian rushes into the house to get more cookies for his sister. While Kian was getting the cookies, he suddenly heard Nasia scream, making him rush immediately outside. And to his horror, he sees a young crocodile, presumably four feet, biting Nasia's leg and grabbing her. Kian was scared and screamed for help as he was too terrified to go near the crocodile to grab his sister. After he hears and sees his sister beg for help, he can't bear it and tries holding his sister's arms to pull her out, but the crocodile's jaws are tightened on her legs and lower body already. Naja kept crying as Kian tried to find a way to get her out of the crocodile's jaws. Suddenly, he rushes inside his home and finds a shovel, which he thinks is heavy enough to hit the crocodile. He runs outside and quickly goes behind the crocodile, then hits the crocodile's back several times to hurt the animal. The crocodile got injured, which caused it to open its jaws and step back, allowing Kian to pull his sister out by grabbing her arms. The crocodile attempted to bite Kian as soon as he rescued his sister, but he hit the crocodile with the shovel again before it could pounce on him. The crocodile went away and was immediately caught by the neighbors who witnessed the attack. Shahani immediately goes to their house and sees a wounded Nasia. She took the little girl to the hospital with Kian as their parents also heard the news and left work for a while to take care of their child. And because of Kian's bravery and love for Nasia, the little girl survived and is recovering from the attack. 
Puerto Princesa, Palawan, in the Philippines, is heaven for nature lovers. It is best known for being home to the world-famous Puerto Princesa Subterranean National Park. Because of its outstanding diversity and fantastic wildlife, it's visited by tourists worldwide. Lance and Enrique are two workers at the Sabang Mangrove Forest in Puerto Princesa, who are tour guides assisting with the mangrove boat tours. Today, the two are tasked with testing the new boats they'll use for the next batch of boat tours. Enrique sat near the boat's bow and Lance near the stern. The two paddled their way into the mangrove forest as Lance suddenly opened up about the frequent increase in crocodile attacks in their area. Speaking of the devil, while the two were talking to each other, they unexpectedly saw a mid-sized crocodile just resting behind a mangrove tree on their way. Lance insisted they should turn the boat around immediately, while Enrique ensures him that the crocodile won't do anything. Lance just gave in and decided not to argue with Enrique anymore. They paddled the boat slowly beside the crocodile, trying hard not to threaten it. As they floated across the crocodile, Enrique decided to stop for a few seconds and look at it. Lance thought it was a terrible idea and pleaded for Enrique to head back immediately. Enrique shrugged him off as he leaned against the boat and stared at the crocodile. Unexpectedly, the crocodile suddenly snapped at Enrique, causing him to flinch and sway the boat from the impact. The crocodile becomes threatened as Enrique tells the now panicking Lance to turn the boat around and head back. As they turned the boat around, the crocodile approached it and bumped the bow part while Lance and Enrique held on to the side so they won't fall off. Enrique attempted to grab his paddle, but as soon as his hands left the boat's sides, the crocodile struck the boat again, throwing him into the sea. The crocodile grabbed him by the torso and put him in a death roll. Enrique was squirming and screaming as he could feel the crocodile's teeth in his body. On the other hand, Lance grabs his paddle and smashes it onto the crocodile's head. He also fell into the water, but kept his composure and continued hitting the paddle into the crocodile. When the crocodile opened its mouth slightly, Enrique used his strength to pry its jaws open, which Lance decided to help. The two of them screamed as they forced open the crocodile's jaws, and when Enrique escaped, Lance landed a final blow on the crocodile's head with the paddle. The two immediately got on top of the boat as Lance rushed Enrique to the hospital. After the incident, the management of the Sabang Mangrove Forest went to investigate it and decided to put the crocodile into a conservation center so that it wouldn't attack more people in the future. The story is not set in an overly exotic country, but in the United States. The United States does not have crocodiles, as it has an abundant population of alligators, another crocodilian species. However, this story takes place in a place where many people flock so they can see a wide variety of animals, the zoo. Spencer Stone was a young man enthralled by the idea of nature and wanted to soak up as much information as possible about the different animals this specific zoo in the Midwestern U.S. had. In April of 1998, Spencer went to the zoo early in the morning because he was told that an organized tour was happening and wanted to sign up for it. Luckily for him, plenty of slots were available, and the group walked around the zoo, getting small lectures from the tour guide. There was something different about this tour, however. On this particular day, the zoo was organizing an event where visitors could walk up and touch the crocodiles in their enclosure, in the presence of a reptile keeper. Not being one to back down from new experiences, Spencer was the first to volunteer, and promptly followed the keeper to the enclosure. The two of them crouched next to a giant crocodile, with the keeper as a shield between Spencer and the beast. Spencer was allowed to touch the croc on the keeper's command, so he slowly extended his arm and touched the croc's back. It was hard and scaly, and he could feel the sheer muscle underneath the layer of armor. Spencer was amazed. After that, the keeper offered to let Spencer feed the croc a piece of meat to see how quickly their jaws snapped shut. This was being watched by the other group members through the glass panels surrounding the enclosure. Spencer accepted. When the keeper twisted his body to the side to grab some meat from the sack next to him, Spencer thought it would be nice to move his hand up the croc's back to feel it out more. He got to the neck, made eye contact with the creature, 
and felt a jolt of power from underneath his hand. The crocodile twisted towards Spencer in a fraction of a second and grabbed hold of his left arm just below the elbow. The crowd watching the display started screaming and some rushing away to get help. A scream left his throat as he felt the immense pressure of the giant maw pressing into his arm, snapping the bones. The keeper was startled by the actions of the croc as it was supposed to be docile. Despite this, the keeper immediately called for help and tried to help Spencer pry the jaws open and free himself. To Spencer's horror, he felt the croc move to one side. He remembered from the guide that crocodiles would roll to snap off entire limbs, so he acted quickly and moved his body as close to the croc as possible so that if it proceeded, he would roll with it. It never rolled, but increased the pressure on his arm to which Spencer instinctively gouged his fingers as deep into the croc's eyes as possible, which forced him to release his arm. Panting and panicking, Spencer was carried out of the enclosure while the keeper held the croc back with meat and a metal rod. Spencer was taken to the nearest hospital and spent a few weeks in recovery, but had to undergo years of therapy for the incident. The keeper was fined and the zoo banned all live interactions with dangerous animals from that point on. Nothing is more horrifying than coming face to face with a massive crocodile. In years after its death, a man from the Philippines named Angelito shares his experience as a young boy when he encountered Lolong, the largest saltwater crocodile ever caught, just months before officials saw it. Angelito was only a 13-year-old boy when he decided to bond with his older brother Bernard at Bunawan Creek in the province of Agusan del Sur in the Philippines. As they arrived at the creek, Angelito and Bernard sat at the creekside nearest the water and dipped their feet in it. They talked about how their week went while eating some cookies and juice Bernard bought for them. While talking, Angelito suddenly asked Bernard if he had heard rumors of a massive crocodile lurking around Bunawan Creek where they were sitting. Bernard was surprised and laughed as he said he was too busy with work to find out about rumors and that Angelito was too good at getting gossip from other people. Angelito was pissed off as he insisted the rumors were true, which was also why he wanted him to bond with Bernard at Bunawan Creek in the first place. Bernard assured him that those were rumors and even joked that their feet were still intact in the water. The young boy didn't mind his brother, as he still believed the rumors were true. Suddenly, Bernard stood up and went into the creek to prove to Angelito that the story wasn't true. Angelito tried to warn him, but Bernard seemed fine after a couple of minutes of wading in the water. This led Angelito to think that maybe the rumors weren't true, and he decided to join his brother in the creek. As they were waiting together, a large and solid thing bumped into Angelito, causing him to trip and fall into the water. When Bernard went to look at the water, he was shocked to see a giant crocodile, now attempting to take Angelito's legs into its mouth. When Angelito saw the crocodile, he panicked and stood up for the water as he instructed his older brother that they should run away. As they were running away, the crocodile attempted to bite Angelito as it chased him and opened its mouth, only for his teeth to scrape the boy's leg as he tried his best to run as fast as he could without looking back, even if he was hurt. When they finally escaped the crocodile, Bernard noticed the scratch on Angelito's legs and decided to do first aid on the wound. Afterward, they reported the incident to their parents, which also happened to be one of the officials in their place. Months after searching, after many other people came to testify the existence of the crocodile, Lolong was caught and was named the largest saltwater crocodile ever caught.